morning. Good morning. Oh, it's that February day. You're not quite awake yet. I know how it feels, but the sun's coming up nice and early. Let's try again. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Great to have you here. Welcome to worship at the University Church in Yale. It's on a very special day on the church calendar. The end of the season after Epiphany, which has taken us from the Christmas story of the three magi through the beginning of Jesus' ministry to this day, which is called Transfiguration Day, when who Jesus was was fully revealed to his disciples. The season of Lent begins on Wednesday, for Ash Wednesday, as we begin seven weeks of preparation for the Holy Week in this Easter. So this is a big transition day. You are welcome here, wherever you are on your journey of faith, whatever questions you have, we hope to be a community that welcomes you and supports you as you become who God dreams you might be. We're blessed to have Pastor Jenny preaching today. Benjamin on the church of the coordinator will give our prayers. And now we're celebrating Holy Communion with lots of other members and our members music. You're invited to participate as you feel called or comfortable. One item is a few of our bulletins are missing a cover. Uh, we, had a, we had a printing issue on Friday. Uh, we decided not to kill another 10 trees just to make them perfect. Uh, but everything you need is your <laughs> vote. Now, those who are able, please stand and join me in our call to worship. Oh God, you reveal your glory in so many ways. As light to the shepherd, before Jesus' birth. In the angel song that says, Peace on earth. In the dazzling form of Jesus on the mountain. In the presence of Moses and Elijah. In the beauty of creation. In the lives of those around us. And carried deep within our own hearts. May our worship today also show your glory. To lighten our hearts and ground us in hope. Amen. The 50 is the season of light. As I said, from the star to let the Magi to Christ's light on the mountain. And so we sing, Christ be our light. with the ways that we may have sinned or fallen short, 
Let us bring them before God, knowing that we are embraced by a God of mercy. So soon you'll be invited to pray your prayer of confession individually in silence, and then we'll have our unison confession all together. Let us pray. Let us continue in prayer. God, who dazzles and surprises us, give us clarity that we might understand who you are and who we are. We confess that we do not always find ourselves transformed by witnessing your divinity. Sometimes we get glimpses of just how powerful and beautiful you are through worship, your word, or each other. But we return to our daily lives unchanged. Forgive us for all the times we don't act in accordance with the grace and revelation that you have given us. Amen. Amen. Siblings in Christ, hear the good news. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life has gone, a new life has begun. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. The peace of Christ be always with you. And also with you. Let us now turn to your neighbor, greet them with a sign of Christ's peace, maybe with a handshake, a peace sign, a wave. Let us share Christ's peace with one another. We'll also give a wave to our folks on YouTube. Aaron were among your priests. They cried to you, and you answered. 
You spoke to them out of the pillar of the cloud. They came to the priests and the laws that you gave them. O holy God, you answered them indeed. You forgave them, yet punished evil. Proclaim the greatness of God. And the worship of God's holy mountain, for our God is the Holy One. How could they conceive of such a thing? 
resurrection. And even if they had been able to conceive of it, we rarely process good news in the immediate wake of bad news. It just goes in one ear and out the other. In fact, when Peter heard Jesus' pronouncement of his coming death, he interrupted Jesus and said, Never, Lord, this shall never happen to you. Jesus then, in a surprisingly strong response, turned to Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Now, these words have stuck with me as I've been preparing for this morning. We didn't read them in our Gospel reading, but they're right at the end of Matthew 16, just before our reading for today. You are a stumbling block to me. These words must have really hurt Peter. I can imagine they knocked the wind out of him and also confused him. How can it be bad to want to prevent Christ's suffering? How could that not be also what Jesus wanted? It's only natural then that in today's reading, after witnessing this amazing, magnificent moment on the mountain, when Jesus' divinity, divinity suddenly broke into the world, his face shining like the sun, and Moses and Elijah, two central leaders in Jewish tradition, were suddenly in Peter and James and John's midst, seemingly back from the dead, conversing with Jesus. With all of this in mind, we can understand why Peter wanted to cling to this moment. Why he wanted to preserve the goodness and hold off the suffering. Why to him it made sense to offer to build three tents. One for Jesus, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Maybe, Peter thought, with earthly tents and earthly homes, maybe these three legendary figures of hope and salvation could remain a while. Protected accessible and safe, safe from harm, safe from condemnation, safe from seeming earthly failure. But again, Jesus didn't like Peter's response. On top of this, even God doesn't seem to have liked Peter's response, for God interrupted Peter mid-idea. I want to pause here. Can you imagine being interrupted by the voice of God? Scripture is specific that Peter was still talking, and suddenly, the mountaintop was covered with a great cloud, and God spoke through the bright fog and said, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. After the cloud dispersed and the voice faded away, Jesus dispensed with Peter's idea of the tents, and they journeyed back down the mountain on their way imminently to Jerusalem and all that was to follow. Now, it is good and intended, I think, that when we read this story, we relate to Peter. So much of what is in him is in each of us. But the more I have sat with the text, the more I have realized how important it is to look at this experience not just from Peter, James, and John's perspective, but also from Jesus' perspective. For in this story, we witness Christ's real willingness to let go of his power his resolve to move forward towards Jerusalem, and his commitment to journeying with the concerns of God in mind. He's not stumbling over Peter's well-intentioned hope of changing the arc of Christ's time on earth, but instead he's embracing his path and moving through it with much faithfulness, courage, and hope of a different kind that Peter doesn't yet understand. Too often, I assume... Jesus was always ready for the task that was before him. When I think about Christ's Lenten journey, a journey we're about to go on again, starting this Wednesday with Ash Wednesday, when I think about Christ's journey, I often forget about Jesus' humanity, and I instead only emphasize his divinity in my mind's eye. For how could a human, even a human motivated by such great love, knowingly journey towards the cross? It is here that I want to consider that God might have gifted the transfiguration on that mountaintop to Jesus. That this moment, this transfiguration of Christ, was a love letter of sorts. A reminder from God. A moment of great embrace, of great power, of great hope. 
A moment God took to remind Jesus of who he is, whose shoulders he stands upon, and what great goodness he was going to bring about by living into his truth. It sounds small to focus on Jesus instead of just Peter, but this window into the transfiguration story has been really transformational for me. What if Jesus' transfiguration wasn't even for the disciples' benefit? What if it was truly all about Christ, with God responding to Christ like a loving parent and attentive friend, with God moving as Christ's creator and sustainer, giving him manna or nourishment for the journey? In Matthew chapter 16, when Jesus first shared the difficult news about the suffering that was to come, when he reacted surprisingly strongly to Peter, I think we get a window into how hard it must have been for Christ to witness the heartbreak and confusion in his friend's eyes. I think this is why it was such a strong emotional reaction from Jesus to Peter when he calls him Satan. Maybe Jesus' evocative words aren't about what he's teaching Peter, though there's that too, but more about how emotional this was for Jesus. Saying to Peter, stop, will you? This is going to be hard enough as it is. Please don't pretend that it won't be, because I might not make it through to the other side. I want you to be ready, my friends, so that you can be alongside me. I can't handle it if you're in denial about what is to come. I want you to simply accompany me. Come alongside me. Don't try to fix it. Just be beside me during it. That's what I'm inviting. Peter's denial about Jesus' struggle may just have been the largest potential stumbling block for Christ. Because if Peter had remained in denial, then Jesus might have felt that much more alone along the way. Alone even as there were crowds surrounding him, praising his name. And I know that this can be true in our own lives, too. Sometimes it's really difficult to hear about someone suffering, especially someone that we love. So we inadvertently sugarcoat it. We try to make it not be true by denying its truth. It's only human that we respond to this, this way to people because suffering is uncomfortable and witnessing suffering is uncomfortable. We don't mean harm by our instinct to find silver lining or say something isn't as bad as someone thinks it is. But by denying someone's truth, especially when that truth is difficult, we can further their isolation the act, exact opposite of our intention. This fear, I think, is why Jesus responded to Peter in such a strong way. Saying, you are a stumbling block to me, Peter, if you pretend this will never happen. I need you to come with me with an open heart. With your heart open to this not going how you think it will or how you want it to, but being present to me in the midst of it all. God must have noticed Christ's struggle. I think. So God graced Jesus with a moment of camaraderie on that mountaintop, a moment of encouragement, a holy moment reminding Jesus that he was not alone in all that was about to happen. God, God brought Jesus to the mountaintop and reminded him of who he is and whose he is. All of us, I think, need this reminder at different points in our life as well. God reminded Jesus of Moses and Elijah two leaders whose journey Jesus is connected to, two ancestors that were often misunderstood, just like Jesus is, two people who suffered much, who yet also brought such life and hope to his Hebrew and Israelite peoples, two prophets who must have often felt alone, even though they were never truly alone, for God was beside them, working beyond what they could see during their time on earth. And then, as, 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 as if seeing Moses and Elijah wasn't enough to encourage and uplift Jesus, God did even more, and God spoke aloud, something that God doesn't do very often in the New Testament. Interrupting Peter when he so earnestly wasn't reading the room, God spoke right into Jesus, uttering the same words as were said when the heavens opened and Jesus was baptized, saying, This is my Son saying, You are my son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Implicitly telling Jesus also to listen to his own voice, to listen and to speak 
for he had much to say and do. And he could do it all with the knowledge that he is known, that he is loved, that he is claimed, and that he is sent forth by God. Sent by the same God who claims and sends Peter. Sent by the same God who claims and sends us. As Christians today, as we experience this story, and in the season of Epiphany and looking towards Lent, as we move through our own earthly journeys, the small everyday journeys, and the larger turning points and transitional moments in our lives, as we move between our own mountaintop moments where everything seems amazing, and the seasons where we feel like we're in the valley, let us learn alongside Peter and Christ about the nature of companionship at its best, and about God's nature, and all of God's loving creativity, where God seeks to remind us of that every day. Let us let ourselves relate to and learn from Peter. I mean, he's so relatable. Peter, who needed to slow down and then listen to that which was difficult in the life of his friend without trying to fix it. Peter, who needed to slow down and linger in that which was joyful on the mountaintop, without rushing past the wonder to action. Peter, who needed to just slow down. And let us also learn from Christ. Christ, who needed companions for the journey. Christ, who needed reminders of who he was and what he was called to. And Christ, who was met, just like we are, by a God who knew him, who loved him, and who claimed him as God's own. This Transfiguration Sunday, let us be so bold as to slow down, and so open as to receive God's gift of being known. For there is much yet to unfold, unfold on our earthly journeys, but God is with us, speaking on mountaintops, journeying alongside us through the valleys, and gifting us more than we can yet perceive.
our time of prayer is participatory. After I read the loving God, you are invited to respond by saying, receive our prayers. Let's practice that now. Loving God, receive our prayers. Moving into prayer, I invite you to get into a position that is comfortable and meaningful for you. Inhabit this space and make it your home. Take up the room in ways that you need, surrounded by people who will be doing the exact same thing. This is a place of welcome. You belong here, and your prayers are received by God. And as always, whenever I leave prayer here at UCLA, being the big believer in breathing that I am, I ask you to take a big breath in and let it go. Loving one, you commanded us to pray. Throughout scripture and Christian witness, we are reminded again and again to pray, to petition, to gather together and lift our concerns, our praises, our very lives to you. The minute details and grand worries that contour our perceptions and ways we exist within creation. And God, we do so together, being your church this morning. We pray for ourselves, for what is going on in our individual lives, for what is on the forefront and in the background of our minds, for what we have done this past week, and what we are to do this week, for assignments, responsibilities, requirements, loving God, Receive our prayers. And still expand our view to include those outside of ourselves. Call to our attention our loved ones, our families, friends, neighbors, and enemies. Impress upon us a desire to care and serve all people within and without our spheres, imitating your presence and perfecting your divine image, sustained by your grace. Help us to love others in the very ways you model and call us toward. Loving God, receive our prayers. God, we call to mind all the violence taking place in our world. We pray for the lives lost, for those cast away from their homes as refugees. We ask for the safety and protection of those who live in fear and anxiety. And we call for the violence to cease. You, God, whose way is peace, whose promise is life, and whose essence is love, bring an end to all violence upon this earth, so that your kingdom replaces all earthly kingdoms forever. Loving God, receive thy prayer. Spirit of life and love that resides within and among us, we continue in love and prayer for all transgender people, so many of whom live under the weight of violence, fear, and intolerance. We hold in love and prayer all the ways that transgender people have survived and thrived in a hostile world. We hold in love and prayer all who recognize the significance of gender justice for all people. And we pray for legislators that they might lead with love and justice. Loving God, we pray for Derek Woodward, Woodard, his mother Susan, his family, his housemates and friends. Loving God, you who know us so well and hold us so intimately, you who call to us and love us in ways beyond imitation, you who is in and through all beyond mystery and knowledge, we give these prayers to you. We expect you to respond. And we do so in loving trust. Loving God. Receive that prayer. Amen.
blessed here at the University Church to be able to give our offering to neighboring organizations in New Haven endeavoring to help others. We ask that you give cheerfully, exercising our faith, and giving as God has given to us. This morning our offering will go to support Black Infinity Collective. Black Infinity Collective works in New Haven to develop black leadership, invested in the survival and nourishment of all black people through care and healing. The offering will now be received.
this Christ's table. This is a table of forgiveness, not a table of judgment. After we say and sing the ancient prayer of great thanksgiving, servers will come up and stand at the head of each of the three aisles. And you're invited to come forward whenever you wish, and the server will give you a piece of bread, and then if you can take a cup of grape juice from the tray that the server will offer you. We have two options now. You can lower your mask as you come up and simply eat and drink what you receive, or if you wish, you can leave your mask on, step aside, and lower your mask and receive. Uh, there are baskets for the empty cups, and also at the head of each aisle. If you do not wish to receive, but would like to have a blessing, simply don't hold up your hands, and the server will give you a blessing. If you'd like a gluten-free communion, please come to the center station. Those of you on YouTube who are celebrating with us today are ready to bring your elements close. And now we do say this ancient prayer of the church. May God be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift, lift them up to God. God. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God, God thanks and praise. praise. This prayer comes from the Church of South India. It says, Glory to God, source of all bounty and beauty, whose fullness and fragrance can transform us within and without. Glory to God, who has made a covenant with all living creatures and has promised never to forsake the beloved creation. Glory to God, who made us all in the divine image and entrusted earth and earth her life to our care. And so with heavenly beings who sing God's praise always, we sing together. <laughs>
body or in spirit, I invite you to stand as we say together our prayer after communion. First of God, all creation is fully aware of all peoples. We join our whole creation and exalt the praise of your bountiful goodness. You have now touched us with new life and filled us with new growth, that your kingdom will come, that the hungry will be fed, that the oppressed will be set free, that your reconciled will be done, and the earth filled with your knowledge, power, and glory. Amen. The last hymn is a great sort of bookend in the epiphany season because it takes it. Part of the tune for Heart the Herald Angels Sing, taking back to the arrival of the Magi, all the way through to the transfiguration about Jesus being the light of the world.
Also, next week we are in for a treat. For first Lent, we have a guest preacher, the Reverend Dr. Teresa Thames. She is an associate pastor and chaplain at Princeton University. She's a good friend of our office, of Ian and I, and is a phenomenal preacher. Um, she'll be here to preach. And then afterwards, students are invited to stay for a lunch with Teresa. She has an amazing life and um, her ministry. We can also ask her more questions about her sermon. So come for food. No need to RSVP, but all students are welcome to stay after church next week. If you turn your page, um, I'm also very excited to share that Belle Zuckery, one of our deacons who is now um, deacon emeritus but is still in New Haven, is organizing an overdose, overdose prevention training that everyone is welcome to come to. She's been working with all of the churches on the New Haven Green, including us, and has invited us to come and participate. Uh, you'll, be, you'll leave the training, training with Narcan. If you aren't familiar with Nar what Narcan is, feel free to ask me and I, but you'll also learn about it. And it's just to equip us, um, if you wish, to know how to respond to an overdose if that's something that occurs. Uh, no pressure to join, but if you would like to, please let me know, because Belle is looking for a general head, head count. There will also be a training offered later on, if you can't make this one, and she's also organizing the CPR training. So if you're interested in either of those, uh, please talk to me, and I would be happy to connect you. Uh, finally, I'm very excited that we are announcing our UCY Creativity Corner. It's a children's corner, where we all are children of God at heart. And I've been working hard on this with Sarah Ruby, where Sarah and Daryl Dinell will be back with us next week. So it's back in the corner. We used to have children's baskets pre-COVID, and they started falling apart. So we re-upped it. So there are books, there are coloring pages, colored pencils, crayons, sketch pads. Um, please, if you like to doodle and fidget like me in worship, uh, grab colored pencils and a coloring page, and we invite you to participate as you wish. Is that everything? Oh yes, and uh, we have little Beanie Babies um, from Kate's home, actually. Thank you, Kate, for sharing. Um, so little Beanie Babies, and those are mainly for the kids, but if you want to have one too, that's <laughs> nice. And Matthias. Yes, I just wanted to say a brief word. Why don't you come to the mic? Yeah, sure. Ah. I just want to say a brief word about um, the Scola concert this evening, if you turn to the back of your bulletin, Breath of Earth. That's going to be at 5 p.m. in Woolsey Hall. It's going to be a really special concert, premiering a work uh, with text by Peter Cole and music by Aaron J. Curtis, both Yale faculty. And the piece is um, it's a very long work, taking imagery from the book of Genesis in the Garden of Eden, and um, Peter Cole sort of constructed this beautiful poem that is very poignant commentary on our current state of climate change. And the music by Aaron J. Curtis is Absolutely stunning. We spent weeks and weeks putting it together because it's very difficult, uh, but I think you really enjoy it. So that's at 5 p.m. this evening in Woolsey of the season. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, let's join together in our closing benediction these words from the prophet Micah. With what shall I come before the Lord? With God myself, or God and God. God has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, to do justice, and to love kindness, to love kindness, and to move humbly with your God. To move humbly with your God. Amen. Go now, knowing that you are loved and claimed by God. Go with the grace of God, with the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, which surpasses all understanding, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, now and forevermore.